introduce myself. I'm Laura Appenzeller, I'm the executive director of the Research Park. And the reason I'm partially speaking today is I've also been the chair of the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition for years. I've been on the board for now more than 10 years of this organization. And I worked with two administrations in the state on different creative programs for technology-based economic development. And this was one of the programs that had been in the legislature or pursued from the legislature for years to try to enable more R&D with companies throughout Illinois. One of the challenges in the state of Illinois, we're a leader in R&D, but the number of businesses that engage with our higher education institutions is relatively limited. So this is an attempt to have it more ubiquitously um, utilized and to say that we have great higher ed partners, but how do we make their resources and expertise more widely accessible to our business community? So that was sort of the genesis of this program of something that was desired, and we said you need a carrot to do that. It's expensive, and there are reasons why small business doesn't choose to do necessarily research or use facilities. Is there a way that we can uh, make that a little easier? My partner here today, Madeline, is going to tell you a little bit more about the Small Business Development Center, which is funded partially through the state of Illinois to give you free help. So you're always welcome to get free help here at Enterprise Works to our entrepreneurs and residents. Some of them may be here today through Gerald and Cynthia and the team that can offer support. Um, but you can also go to the SBDC, which is just across the street. Madeline, tell them a little about your organization. Thank you, Laura. So I'm Madeline Wolski, the director of the Illinois SBDC at the Champaign County Economic Development Corporation. We're going to use a lot of abbreviations today. Get excited. So I see a lot of familiar faces. I was here last week at the first Friday breakfast talking about SPDC resources. I believe we have some copies of those presentation right at the front desk. So if you want a nice, nice, solid copy of our resources, that's where you can find it. But we are essentially here to help support you and your business through a couple of different ways. And Laura had mentioned, our services are available at no cost to you because of generous funding at the federal, state, and local levels. And so our services include one-on-one -on -one business advising. We also provide workshops and trainings and even some prepaid programs for our clients. And again, all at no cost to you. And you can just go to our website, cusbdc.org, and sign up as a client. So we're actually really excited to be here today to also talk about what are some other local resources you can participate and utilize in to help you access and, and yeah, participate in the Illinois Innovation Vouchers. So we'll talk a little bit more about those during um, the Q&A session, but I'm going to hand the microphone back over to Laura so she can go through her slides. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Madeline, and she'll tag team with me as questions arise. Again, keep this informal, so stop us at any time if you want to ask us um, something or have a thought about it. I'll start with a little bit of a, uh, a commercial for the Illinois Science and Technology Coalition. As it said, I've been a long-time board member. This organization was started under the Thompson administration. For those in the room that may know, he was a governor back in the 80s in Illinois, so it's been a long-running organization whose mission is technology-based economic development for the state of Illinois. It includes membership of almost every university. The University of Illinois was one of the founding members, major corporations, and some of the tech organizations throughout the state. So they're kind of a third-party intermediary that works on policy, data, support programs, and STEM education initiatives in the state of Illinois. But the program itself that we're talking about is actually a DCEO, an Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Program of which was authorized by the state of Illinois actually a while ago. So this program was in 2021 part of legislation, but just became operationalized more recently as available to small businesses. And because of that clock, I'll say, there's only one year of funding that is currently available, and they're supposed to be spending the money by December. So everything we're talking about right now, I'll say, there is some urgency to get the money out the door, and then they may get renewed based on that um, legislation for additional funds, but they really want to have existing cases under their belt by the time the end of the year happens of getting this money out, which is about $2.7 million. And for the small increments we're talking about, that's actually a lot of administration to get that much money out to small businesses in that period of time. Uh, DCEO also went through an RFP process to choose ISTC to be the third party partner on delivering this money. They saw constraints of, I think, if they were having to administer it themselves, but also ISTC brought in a number of other partners, iBio and um, 
IMAC and others that can help with third party advising on the program as well. Okay, so what is it? The Illinois Innovation Vouchers Program is a way for small businesses in Illinois to contract or engage with universities. Small, small businesses is defined as companies that reside in the state of Illinois. It's a pretty loose definition of what's an Illinois small and medium sized business, which I would imagine everybody in the room will qualify for um, under that definition. Uh, there are some ways if a company was out of state but had a lot of its composition of workforce here that they could still qualify. And it's up to $75,000 in funding, which is a maximum of 75% of the project cost to be able to do an innovation project with a higher ed partner. That higher ed partner is not limited to the University of Illinois, so yes, we're here at U of I and it's easy to talk about UIUC, but you could be working with Parkland College in town. You could be working with other institutions across the state. It does need to be higher ed in the state of Illinois. And these projects are meant to be things that enable product development, innovation, or um, furtherance of market, market insights that will uh, benefit your businesses. Applications are on a rolling basis, so you can apply, there's a deadline, just start applying and getting the communication in, and um, as I said, the award timeline's pretty fast. The businesses qualifications, that definition, as I said, is pretty broad. It does need to be a business. They will be doing some subjective review of the qualifications of the business. So if you're a sole proprietor, not as attractive as somebody who has a team. Um, you have to have fewer than 500 employees, which is why I said that almost everybody we engage is going to meet that definition. That's not our big corporations. And there were certain tech areas. These are tech areas that were defined, or industry sectors that were defined by the state of Illinois in its strategic plan, and that's why they're specifically listed. It'd be good in your application if you fit one of these or find one that fits you um, so that you meet the criteria of being a strategic sector because they get points for that, for meeting what DCEO said. They are also looking for applicants that are diverse throughout the state. So if you've got female founder, minority founder, you're in a rural community, all those kinds of things are good to report on. If you're from downstate, which all of you are, that also counts as some brownie points in this process as well. So mention the things that make you look good and qualify the, the boxes that they need to check based on the, the legislative authorization that they were given and the programmatic aims of ISTC. Um, the vouchers, as I said, could be used up to 75% of the cost. Although it's not to exceed 75,000, I would also like to reiterate, it does not need to be of that magnitude. So you could have a $5,000 project of which you're only responsible for 25% of that. So these could be re relatively low dollar things that don't have to be at the, the high range of that. You'll see a list of the things that they mention are qualified and they're not exhaustive in this list. I'm going to go through a few examples more that I think of as pertinent here in our community, but note, these are not all research engagements as we typically think of them at the university. So at the university, when we hear research projects, we think sponsored research. Let's talk about that. If somebody wants to, I've had a conversation with a couple of you about that. Sponsored research is possible. It takes a long time and it costs a lot of money in many cases. There's IP and publication rights and other things to be thinking about as well. So it doesn't have to be that. It could be using facilities on campus. It could be engaging with student projects. It could be working in a more technical testing um, orientation with the university that is an easier type of transactional relationship with the university here or elsewhere. What is not covered? This is, an, I guess, maybe in some ways more important of don't ask for these things. The number one thing that I would mention is you cannot pay for your own staff. So people have asked, they've gotten clever about that. Um, it doesn't pay for your staff. If your staff is considered administration, that is not an allowable expense. Your interns are not considered university, or not supposed to be eligible expense. We did get kind of clever thinking about research for internship program where you have a contract for hiring through the university. I would say maybe, but it's not the intent. You're not supposed to be paying for your own interns. You're supposed to be paying for some externality of assistance from a university or higher education partner. So those are the way that they've scoped that. Um, it does not include a <coughs> website or mobile application development, but it could include things that are more digitally oriented or software if they're more of an innovation product. Uh, the website reference here would be more so um, you have an idea as an entrepreneur and you come to U of I and you want us to build a website for you, that's not gonna be qualified. It also, we commonly have gotten requests in the past where somebody's got 
uh, a brilliant idea they came up with in their head, and they want to come to U of I as a great engineering <coughs> university to actualize that with engineers. That's not going to be the type of thing that we're looking for either. We, we as the state or the institutions generally want to have something where you're bringing know-how and skill and product to the, to the party, and then we're complementing that with skill sets that exist in higher education. And as it's a, we can discuss if you've got questions. It does not um, qualify for costs associated with applying for grants. So I'm looking at our good friend and expert Roland Garden. So somebody like that that would be helping you that in this case he's not working for the university in this capacity, but applying for a grant through the university is not an allowable expense. And if any of these have questions that you want to dive into further, we can talk about them. Yep. Um, what if you're a, you're a small business working with the university and you you know, a research team and they use part of the project funds to fund one of the students on their group. Like, would that count? Yep. So they can be students working in class projects, senior design, others. It could be that you're working with a faculty member and they've got a research team and you're helping to fund a grad student that's aiding your business. But that's a contract between the university and your business. That employee is not your employee, that's an employee of the University of Illinois under a faculty member's direction, or in this case, I think that you're describing. So I think that's, that's fine. It's not that they can't be doing work for you, they're just not your employees. There's some independence there that I think is to meet the criteria that they're seeking. consulting groups on campus and other types of experiential learning programs on campus that I think are, are great timeline funding level that is accessible to small businesses and it gives students a chance to work with your company. So there's some double bottom line in that too that you might recruit them when they're finished with your project. So um, they can be employees after you're done. They're just not getting paid as your employee during the project. And so, there may be some cleverness there, too, of students who are engaged in a non-paid capacity with their company, but they're working with some of these groups on campus, too. Uh, so the application process, there is a lot of information on Illinois, that looks like, I don't know if that's wrong or not. Anyway, Illinois, is, it, is that right? Illinois Innovation Vouchers. If you go to the ISTC website, that, there's a link to the Illinois Innovation Vouchers, and as Madeline noted, also, the FAQs are robust, and and really detailed. They have project examples from other similar types of programs in other states. Um, when I first worked on this, I'll say we ripped it off of Utah. Utah's program doesn't exist anymore, but Maryland and some other states have some really good programs that we borrowed from. So um, we'll give some flattery to other places that were already doing this, and that's why they're examples pre-program establishment in Illinois. Um, so they have started giving some examples from institutions in Illinois, but because this is brand new, they're still referencing other states right now. If you're wondering why, there are other universities in those descriptions. Um, you're going to submit a proposal. I would definitely encourage you, if you want to talk to ISTC, they have a team that is willing to help you. Jacob Berry or Kate Calvera over at ISTC can talk to you about it. I would try to go in with a good scope and not try to um, you know, say, I have a research engagement, be really open-ended with them, because I don't think they're going to be in a great position to solve that. They want to know that you've already got something in mind of a partnership, and then work through some of the mechanics. Um, we had an email exchange, that's me and some of the others that are on the board in higher ed, about um, ICR negotiations. Say, in the timeline we have, there's not going to be like a special ICR agreement for this. Sorry. has to do the full review, but they are making sure that they agree with it at the end of the day, as it's their money. 
potential projects from the University of Illinois. We already talked about some of these. It could be short-term research. I guess in the example you just had, Nina, where you know a faculty member, you know that there may be an opportunity to work with somebody. Uh, a reference I've given across the street from us is the Applied Research Institute, ARI, that's through the College of Engineering. They do a lot of contract research types of projects. They may be a, an appropriate partner to ask for assistance. Um, it could be that you um, already have done some work with a lab in the past and you want to amplify and add to that and so you can engage them. Really common around here is we have a lot of facility use agreements and technical testing agreements on campus. So if you need access to microscopy, you need access to clean labs, you need access to um, IDRL or other facilities like that, the bioprocessing research labs on campus. If you have specialized facilities that you want, could be greenhouses or other things like that on campus, that is using university resources with an appropriately written aim to accomplish something that's developing your product further. So those types of things, since we're big promoters of ag tech around here, if you've got something that's field research where you could engage extension or some other partnership to do some trials out with fields with farms, um, there could be you know, a way that you're working as a small business with a small business farm with a university partner. Um, so just kind of get clever with it. I think there are different ways to address this. Um, also, for those who are doing like animal studies on campus, could be part of work on the biomedical sphere of things, um, or software or data analytics projects like the Disruption Lab might be a good place to go to get that done. Um, OCR, OTCR in the College of Engineering is a student group, but they run money through the College of Engineering, so there may be ways to do things as long as it's not just an independent organization that has no affiliation or flow of money through the university. Yeah. Sorry, I have a few questions about the gray areas and qualifications. Uh, what about um, personnel who will have a dual appointment with a private entity and the university? Maybe. So, I, if, personally, I have an appointment with the university that's actually doing prototyping already for a company. Um, so, I was wondering if that could potentially qualify. Sorry, I'm going to go back to maybe. Okay. They, I mean, if they snip it as it's you paying yourself to do the work that should have been done inside the company, my guess is that that's going to get a lower prioritization. So it's really looking again for externalities of somebody else who's bringing in assistance that the company wouldn't have otherwise had. And how does that interact with founders who happen to be faculty members and have their own lab personnel? Yeah, in some cases, that's the department having to vet themselves, too, because there's some, there's some reasons why they want to be careful about how a faculty member in their conflict of interest or conflict of commitment agreement, they may not want that to be the case. So case by case, generally, there's some concerns in some cases about faculty member funding their own lab, but um, I'm not going to say it's impossible. Okay. Yep. And just to confirm, like, any Illinois higher ed Institute would qualify? Correct. So I'll say like we're sitting here at University of Illinois, so I'm giving a U of I message first. But if you want to go to our friends at Northwestern or U of C or somewhere else, uh, we were talking about for a company the other day that was in something that I thought fermentation oh. or, oh, I was thinking about cross defense. Our, uh, somebody's here from that. But you, you know, they do a lot of work with wineries down there. And so maybe there's a way to engage them differently than we might hear because they have a different area of expertise. So they have iFirm, which is an um, program and Cynthia is the chair of the Illinois Innovation Network. So if you want to know more about public institutions across the state, she may have some good insights too of who's got what good programs to leverage as well. Yeah. Um, we do also run the Illinois Incubator, Illinois University Incubator Network. So we work with all the different institutions across the state. Um, and as I said, don't forget community colleges could be good partners. Parkland here has a lot of ag programs, manufacturing programs, or other things that maybe Madeline could help connect you to as well. Yes? So, uh, just something I've been trying to figure out in the past couple of weeks. So, you know, the cost of the university is about 58%. Uh, so, you know, I've been, to, you know, I was talking with Jay Kukai, and he said that there's no limit on Indirect cost, um, but yeah, I was just, you know, I wanted to see uh, somebody has you know, figured this out. You know, like, can you try to use that? You know, to something. Yeah, like ISTC that? was kind of maybe careful getting recorded, trying to get clever with that. I'm saying it's 
state funding, and there may be agreements with the university that we give a different rate for state funding, but it's really still the small business that's engaging the university, so you're really beholden to whatever our ICR rates are or other institutions, and that was Northwestern and others were holding firm to that as well. It's partially just a period of time of trying to renegotiate something. Generally, though, things to think about at Enterprise Works, as an example, is that we have the waiver of um, some of the ICR rates because of Enterprise Works companies are given that privilege by the OBCRI if you're going to use core labs on campus or interdepartmental agreements that we have. So if there are some benefits that we already have that are regardless of this program that you could note that is you know, maybe makes your application look good because you're not paying the full freight ICR as via being an Enterprise Works client. But generally, the university's external rate is here at U of I is 56%, and that's based on a negotiation with the Navy. The reason the university doesn't want to lower that rate is they have to make a commitment to the federal agencies that they are not undercutting the rate that they are charging them with private users. So there is a reason why the university does it, not just as a, the money that it brings in. So because we are at the research park, we can't get to the lower rates? Specifically, Enterprise Works, any tenant of Enterprise Works has an opportunity to work with. There is a cap of how much you can spend with university units to do facility use agreements, technical testing, and some of the other interdepartmental programs at interdepartmental rates. So if you are a chemistry professor using chemistry resources, you're getting charged a lower rate by your, or maybe nothing to use your existing facilities within your department. But if you're, say, on another department, you're, the, you're ag engineering and you want to go use chemistry department, that's an interdepartmental rate charge. And that's what ours looks like for Enterprise Works because we're using our account number with another department. Is Roger in the room? Roger helps us with that. So talk to Roger, I guess. I don't see Sarah or Roger. But Roger's back there, can talk about interdepartmental charges. Enter IQ. Um, yeah, so at the university, you may hear an acronym since we're acronym soup of um, a CFOPL. A CFOPL number is an internal university account. And you don't have one as a company, but we all at university departments have CFOPLs. So we're giving another department our CFOPL with an activity code that is your company. And we can track that back then. It was this company A, B, or C based on their activity code. And then we tack that onto your rent. So it's an administrative ease to the other departments also, also because they don't have to set up individualized contracts with your company or be the accounts receivable on your behalf. We are doing that as through Enterprise Works. So this has long been a part of our business that has helped, I think, companies work throughout the university in a more nimble way. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to confirm: is there any issue with like multiple businesses referencing the same like university group or anything like that? I don't think so. I think they will want to be able to show off variety. If they're reporting this out in January of all the things that were done, I'm guessing they want to show a bunch of different businesses, different diversified sectors, examples throughout the state of Illinois, so they're touching different geographies, they'll want to show some diversity of the founders that they're helping, and the different um, types of ways that they were able to help. So if everybody went to the College of Engineering and wanted to use mechanical engineering prototyping services that you know might not satisfy all the, the PR they want out of the program, but there isn't any uh, restriction on how much is being spent with one particular flavor of money. And it maybe there's, again, I haven't seen all the applicants, but there may be a way for a company like Matrix to say, we're working with mechanical engineering and we're working with another small business. Small business comes, Illinois small business comes to Matrix. You have the know-how to understand CNC machining and how to do engineering design and product development. And then you're going to go utilize services from mechanical engineering, of which 75% is reimbursable. But maybe there's a way that two small businesses are essentially benefiting from it. So I think some creativity is a good thing. Okay, Talk to Jacob about it. Make sure. I mean, it's a sales pitch to the agency that you're explaining how it benefits small businesses in Illinois and not just you as a, pro a professional service provider. So they gave a few examples of different things that could be done. This is a manufacturing company in Rockford, and they talked about uh, the work that they were doing on um, with Northwestern. It's a three-month engagement, and just some of the examples of, of work are listed here of strengths and how they rated them. There's a cybersecurity project. 
Uh, this is in Chicago, and so they're developing new cybersecurity software um, as part of the project and working with the University of Chicago. This is an ag tech company example where um, it's a company out of Peoria, and they are working with the University of Illinois on a field and feasibility study. And I think that's all we have for today. So Madeline, I'll say, I think you were going to share some examples, too, or thoughts of clients you've worked with on this so far. Well, thank you so much, Laura. If there's anything I want anyone to take away from this is really utilizing the resources on the website within, um, uh, yeah, the Illinois Voucher at ISDcoalition.org. They have a fantastic FAQ question, and some of the questions that I've been receiving from um, small businesses interested in participating um, in this, and also from the university side, most of them have been answered within the FAQs. It's a fantastic resource, and I really encourage looking through that thoroughly. Um, as far as how we can assist you within this program, um, Laura had mentioned a lot of Fantastic, all fantastic things, but I wanted to harp upon how your project can benefit small businesses in Illinois and how I can work with you to help brainstorm a lot of different ways creatively we can help to identify what are the needs of small businesses, um, how does the specific focus in whichever sector relate to them directly. So that's something that I've been doing a lot with some existing businesses wanting to participate in this program. Um, in addition, looking at that list of items that aren't covered. Um, we've been helping clients cover those items. So especially if you're like, you know what, maybe the 25% um, that I'm responsible for is a little bit out of our price range right now. Know that we do have a micro lender in our office. It's run by a nonprofit called Justine Peterson. They focus on micro loans up to $50,000. So it's really difficult to get a traditional loan lower than $100,000, and especially since this is realistically a lower amount that you'll need to contribute, I highly recommend maybe utilizing a micro loan provider if you don't have that capital at this time. Um, yeah, but that's really the biggest thing, is that we're here to help you brainstorm how to best position yourself advantageously to take advantage of this program. Um, because essentially what we're writing is kind of just a business plan in the application. And we can absolutely help you do that. Do we have any questions? Yes. Um, thank you for your leadership in this. This is awesome. And I just want you to know I appreciate that. Um, the qualified expenses you talked about earlier, the new product, and process development, commercialization of new or enhanced products. I'm an examples guy and I'm just if you could maybe paint a picture of what that might look like. Let's say we're gonna put some sensors in some barns and on campus at the mine facilities and see what data output we're gonna get from that. That might be a good example of leveraging a university facility. There might be grad students who are pulling data from that and giving it back to your company. It could be that there's something that you don't know fundamentally, like an animal health question, where it's going to work with the natural spine researcher to understand something that's a respiratory illness that might be detected with a sensor or software that you've developed and that you want to engage them over the summer to do um, some sort of data reporting for you from animals or to do some clinical work with the animals on campus. And let's just say, based on that completely hypothetical... It has nothing to do with your company at all. Um, <laughs> we need some of... The, if there's technology that we need to kind of filter that data, but it's not yet built. You might have software development to help you build something that doesn't exist yet. A software capability that's a, a missing digital link to the, the product insights that you are bringing is that you understand how livestock operations work and have, I don't know, I don't even know the specifics of your stuff at this point, so I'll, I'll make it up. You already have advanced sensors and you already have some way that you're going to measure temperature conditions or other things that are happening, but you're missing a software link that's going to take that, put that into the cloud, and you're going to go to the construction lab on campus or to OTCR or somebody who has software capabilities to build you that that widget or that platform or 
um, whatever it is that's needed for you to go from a duct tape version of software to something that is has um, a, a, an interface that will make it be able to scale better. Awesome. Your, yeah, an API development or something like that might sound better than I'm building a mobile app prototype. And also utilizing Gerald Wilson in the back to help you with that matchmaking. If we have this idea and then it's like, okay, so which department slash university resources within this ecosystem could I best take advantage of? To put words in their mouth. But. <laughs> hey, Madeline. Thank you very much Matt, for the explanation. Um, I have a question. Uh, when you use Blue the Vouchers program, the University of Illinois Resources, what are the IP implications? I was just realizing when I gave the answer to Andy that there's a, an asterisk on some of that. So if you're using technical testing or facility use on campus, you own the IP that is explicit in the template agreements that are available on the website at SPA. So Sponsored Programs Administration at the University have all kinds of templates. Look for a TTO agreement or an FUA facility use agreement. They will make it clear there's no publication right and no IP rights to the university. So that's, in some ways, it's good. You've got that as a template that you're following and it's explicit and understood. You go to a faculty member and you want to do sponsored research, typically, even though you have funded the research or a majority of that research, there's still background IP involved. And the university will have rights to the IP and have to license it back to you. It may be that they're going to give you a exclusive um, freedom to use that, but that isn't something you should make an assumption. Generally, you need to go through OTM, and that will be part of a sponsored contract agreement that's going to state, do you have NERC non-exclusive rights? I'm looking at Alan. I get the acronym. Sorry, I'm not OTM. There's a couple of the right to practice. <clears throat> <clears throat> the university typically keeps the right to practice internally for sure. There's an acronym, but it's a non-exclusive license that is easily granted to you as a sponsor, but that isn't necessarily what you want as a small business. You are often looking for the exclusivity, and you often don't want the publication done by a grad student when you haven't been able to protect it on your end yet. So just think about research engagements. Sometimes they can be really helpful to augment and aid what you're doing, and in some cases they raise concerns where we have an EIR like Alan who might help you think through some of those things before you do them that are not worth taking the money and doing because you really want to do something on a very proprietary basis. It's one of the reasons I mentioned these other forms of like student capstone projects. Those all have in their template agreements that you own the IP. They most of the time have NDAs that are already written in for the students that they can't talk about projects. Um, at ARI, because they're contract research, which means they often are not, they could engage a faculty member, they're often using their staff, and their staff are not seeking tenure, and they're not researchers by nature of needing to publish, so they can do contract research in ways that are more transactional. So just think about different flavors and methodologies of engaging with universities. Extension's another example, like if they're working with farms, those things, uh, uh, they Usually, they don't own that, they're doing it as an extension service. So it depends on what flavor of a university engagement you're pursuing, uh, if there are IP implications. But if you need the know-how of somebody to invent, truly invent for you, there's probably gonna be an IP relationship where that faculty member is bringing know-how to the project that is not a recipe you gave them to execute. It's not just asking for undergraduate students to do it as an experiential learning assignment. It is something where you are asking for IP development on your behalf, therefore there is IP ownership that has to be negotiated as part of that agreement and engagement. Feel free to add to that journal if there are other things that you think are the right method or not. Um, none of these are to say one is the right one or the wrong one. I just think think through what your outcomes are and be clear up front um, with whoever you're working with what you need. And if it doesn't work, try another flavor. Um, I was having a little bit of conversation about just experiential learning. It has exploded all over campus. Virtually every department has a capstone or some sort of practicum that they're running. Uh, the MNG program is a master's in engineering is looking for a lot of projects. So there may be, they're not all undergrad programs that have these IP rules associated with them that say if you give it as a class project that you own it. Um, the master's programs are often a good place to look for that as well. And we can help you kind of think through where you might find certain resources uh, to do that. And if it's a 
class project, just keep in mind, it probably is going to have to align with the fall semester, which means you've got to get it cooked up now to have it as a fall semester project because they have to be able to assign that to students as part of their work. Another just commercial is IBC. Many of you have worked with Illinois Business Consulting through GEES. They have professional staff. They do a really good job of managing and giving you deliverables of outputs. They can do fairly technical things. I used to think of them as only doing market research, which I think is prohibited here. Maybe they did one last year, I know, but it's not been what they've been focusing oh, on. Illinois vouchers, I think, doesn't oh, want to fund market research. Correct. Illinois does not want to do market research. So geese would be fantastic. SBDC, we have a free market research resource. Yeah, as well. But I was gonna say we just did a project with IBC, which will be rolling out more, but we had them work with our sales force and do a CRM dig of our data for 20 years and then do a Tableau interface for us that the students executed. That is not something we had capability to do in-house. And I would say that's an example that you, would, I, I think you can spin, it's a, it's, a, it's a product that gives your users or some sort of interface that's interesting that you can't develop yourself. So students do do things that are fairly technical as outcomes um, that can be great. So database types of things. And iSchool is another great place where they have capstone projects. We love the iSchool. Okay, you can give an iSchool yeah. commercial. I know, well. That's where I got my master's, so I'm biased. <laughs> um, so, go, go ahead, go ahead, please. Um, so we use a uh, facility on like campus like all the time to verify our technology and stuff. Could we spin it? I mean, we come up with the ideas, we know what we want to do. Yep. Is that enough of a collaboration with the university? Like, we just want to use your facility? I think so. Okay, I was it's like, all in right, like, Cynthia, I think. Like, like we needed we a person. Person. Our diffraction gradings are going to improve because we're using this unique capability yeah. on campus, I mean, and we, we don't have enough house equipment to do it. So. so we don't need a point person on campus, or do we? Well, I think the business manager for that department that does that contract with you for that work is good enough. Yeah, I mean, as long as you get that letter of intent for yeah. that collaboration. Okay, so you have to get that from them. You will okay. have to have a department, which could be a, a business manager. It doesn't have to be a faculty member who's oh. saying, we're going to let you use our uh, material science characterization equipment or something like that for okay. six months. It's going to cost this much, and it provides these specialty services. Okay. Well, we already do it. So it feels like Don't cheating. Don't say that in the Don't reveal information that wasn't asked. <laughs> Well, I mean, it is a new, we, it is a new field and all that, so yes. Of it's new. It's yeah. innovative. It, it, well, it has not been done before if it no, hasn't occurred truly, today. No, it truly <laughs> hasn't. But I mean, the, the idea that we use facilities is like, that's not that's, that's I'm encouraging. It's something that lots of our clients have already done, and it's a way to pay for that in some way, that's like using university. The robust instrumentation and resources of the university at a research university, and it could be here or elsewhere. It's maybe something you've never done. Again, I'm not trying to sell against our own university, but yeah. say there's something that exists up at Northwestern or at Argonne that you, not Argonne, because there's not a university, but through U of C that they can contract with you and okay. that you wouldn't have gone to them before because you're used to using these, so that's new. Okay, okay. Got it. Thank you. This might be an FAQ, sorry uh, if it is, but um, does the program expect the final report, like a wrap-up report? Of yes. Sorts? It seems like they were being they were being pretty onerous in the beginning of how much reporting they wanted small businesses to do. So I think make sure you're clear of like this is this is onerous in some way. So this is the expectation of what I can give you. I will give you the. Uh, where we are and engaging, they want to make sure that the money's getting out the door by December, so they don't want to be surprised in December that the work hasn't started. I'll give the class project example I was talking about. We are engaging with for a fall project. You're going to give a report out that that agreement has been signed and is ready to go by the start of the school year. The students are giving you their timeline of what's going to be deliverables on their part, and you're going to say, we've had our initial team meeting with the students. They've given us their origin, their you know scope and timeline of execution, and then they have the mid-project touch point, and their final presentation is going to be given before finals at the end of the year. We have the final closeout report, something like that. That's sort of the phasing that they can expect. That those are reasonable things that you could check the box on. They're not going to dig in to look at like 
what are the results of that? What did they actually, what does that software look like? They don't need to see that level of detail, they just want to make sure that it's progressing based on the timeline of what you said or the scope that you put in your application. They would love to share stories at the end. So this is all say of, of listening to these conversations. They want to be able to have some slides and say, hey, because I just looked at some and it, if you look at that paragraph, some are better than others. You know, storytelling is really important and they want to be able to get more money out of the legislature and continue this program into future years. So if you can help them by sharing something, it doesn't have to reveal a secret sauce, um, it, but it can say, I'm a cybersecurity company and I was able to develop something that enabled banks to have a new technology or a new interface that we didn't have before and I worked with this department and you have a testimonial of a student who worked on it that got valuable experience through that process. So just think there's a little marketing sizzle that comes out at the end but it doesn't have to reveal the, the secret sauce of what was made. Yeah. And the SBUC operates off of grant funding from DCEO which I help apply for. So I'm happy to give you that inside kind of perspective and help you kind of position yourself advantageously to what we typically see is once from DCEO. Yeah. Madeline, you referenced kind of emphasizing how our project might help small businesses in Illinois within our application. Is would a qualified expense would a qualified expense include like a, a piloting or a test of our software in a small business environment? It's done by the university, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's that gray area. They're trying to help you as a small business, not for you as small businesses to help other small businesses, mm -hmm. unless that's your target customer as a B2B. And that's also more of like the narrative of, of emphasizing the value of this project to small businesses within the state of Illinois, okay. which it's not a need, but this could position it advantageously from the powers that be. How does this help yeah. Telltale grow as a company? Is how it's helping a small business, not how Telltale is helping another small business. Although that's nice. If you are working with farmers who are small businesses or livestock operations, then you've got double the value of you're helping another form of small business to make innovation growth because of a product that you brought to them that was enhanced by having a university third party involved. Um, for the project, if your time uh, or software is involved, can you consider that like a part of the overall project cost? No. No, no personnel costs of the company. So not you, your students, or your employees that are, are attributed as overhead, I guess. That's my understanding, is they're sniffing around for that, and it was not supposed to be allowed, so say. You find other ways if you can, because I wouldn't want you to get denied after putting all the work for something that might have been available. No business meals, I think. <laughs> Happy hour. Stuff. In fact, could you say a little bit more about the uh, sources, the potential sources of the 25% match at the application stage and then later on at the reporting stage? So you're wanting to know where you can find that funding locally? Uh, well, what's, what's allowed as a source of that funding yeah. to get the program and then what do they ask at the, at the reporting stage? Like, do they ask you to prove where you got the other 25%? think so, Roland. I don't know that I've heard that, that they're going to say your 25% came from revenue versus it came from an SBIR grant versus it came from your own personal money. I don't know that they care. To my understanding, they don't. Yeah. It's not something that they're actively looking for. It's possible, for example. I haven't heard it said. I would be careful. I would, again, don't reveal information that creates a problem later, but like say a company got an SBIR match from the state, which is kind of unrestricted funding, and then they had money in their checking account as a result, but the company funded that 25% match, that's indirectly state match on state funds. I don't know that that would be seen as unallowable because that money coming in was unrestricted in the first place. Right, that's you know that's one of the many scenarios that I had in mind as, as potential, but as far as the applicant, I would just consider that's company match being provided. How they got that money, I don't think is 
important hmm. that you reveal as part of the process? I would be very surprised if they asked for how you sourced the funding. So then the state will not come back and say, prove to us that you actually spent 100% of the funds. We gave you 75%. Yes, yeah, so they will. We'll want to see where that funding went to. And you have an invoice from a IBC. The project cost was $15,000. At the end of it, you paid the Geese College of Business $15,000, of which 75% was is the amount that they gave your company from this program. How the other source of that money was paid there, I don't think there's going to be a lot of accounting on that. They just want to see you pay. You have proof of receipt that you paid that department the amount that was the engagement, uh, okay. 100%. All right. They will ask for that proof at the reporting stage. Yes. Or at some point. Some point, yeah, yeah. that you paid your 25%, and their 75% went to the entity at a higher education institution for the amount you said it was going to be. If the project came in lower, this is a weakness potentially for them, you said you were going to do a project for 100000 After you got going, it ended up being a $50,000 project. Now, they didn't award funds that they could have awarded to another business because you came under budget. The project goes over budget, so you spoke to projects to be 100000 It ended up being a $150,000 project. They're still only going to fund the max of the 75% or 75000 So if you ended up having to pay a $75,000 on a $150,000 project, that's the company's responsibility to come up with those funds, not the program. Okay. And then at the budget stage, when you're filling out the budget, do you enter strictly the budget for the university or for the higher education institution? You don't enter any budget for your own company? All the budget items are? Correct. It needs to be relevant to the project. Oh, relevant to the project, yeah. of course. You don't yeah, need to not. say your indirect costs or any of that kind of stuff you're not accounting for. Okay. So then in the indirect cost part of the budget, do you put the higher education institutions in direct cost? Correct, if it do? exists, which it may not if you're doing a facility use agreement kind of situation. Okay. Or experience, the student practicums wouldn't have that. Depends, I should be a little careful. Depends on how, the con how those agreements, so like that interdepartmental rate versus you're an external company that's not in enterprise works, looking to use microscopy, there's an overhead rate baked into that facility use that facility contract rate. But that would be explicit in the contract you're given from the university. Your external rate is right. $75 an hour to use this piece of microscopy, and you're gonna do that for 25 hours. The cost from the university is right. 25 times $75 an hour. Yeah, if it's just a published rate that includes all the Published rate, yeah. Right. Well, just to go off of what Roland is saying, so for the project, if your company has direct costs associated with that project, you cannot put it in the budget? Because it's a, you know, like, yeah. in my case, it would be a collaboration. We would be working with the university team and spending hours to That's achieve the final goal. goal. So I'm just- That's staff kidding. time still. You can't use that on the match or as part of the, the direct funding. So uh, my company's direct costs on the project are not part of the total project. Correct. And if somebody else can, do, you know, if you've worked on this and you think we're wrong on something, feel free to challenge us as well. We're all learning right now. And a lot of the examples uh, given, it was, it sounds like a lot of the expenses go towards like paying for university services and that sort of thing. I was just wondering, is there a way that we could just directly say like you need to go purchase equipment on like the company side that will be benefiting? like the university group and also the company? I don't think that will be allowable. That's a little more gray than that question that we just answered because it is a direct cost to the universe, to the company of you need to buy more filament to run in the 3D printing machines that are, that's not supplied by the university. If you can get the university to put it in their contract that they're gonna procure those supply and they will materials and supplies and then they're part of your project with them, that would be better. From the uh, sort of a cash flow perspective, uh, you know, think about uh, when you get the grant, when the money comes into the company, when you pay, and then there are, it sounds like it's all going to happen near the end of the year. How can you avoid, you know, income and expense at the end of the year, or is that something to worry about? Yeah, it could be, um, and everybody's, you know, yeah. 
you could, on certain projects, you might be prepaying some of it. So I know for IDC, for example, because we just did a project with them, you have to pay, I think, 25% up front of the project, midway through you're paying 50%, and then the final installment comes at the completion of the project. There may be some benefit to doing it in that way because you're making sure you're front loading it in the actual year you want it attributed to as a business expense. It, or you may not want to because you're going to want to defer money for, for your own cash flow reasons. So I think there, that's really the department's rules. And if you have something you want to prepay, they often are willing to do it. Um, but otherwise, I'd say most of the departments are looking for payment at 30 or something like that. So the, the money comes from the state to the company, and then from the company to the uh, to the university. So because it's new, I don't know how timely they're going to be on that reimbursement. Has anybody? I haven't heard anything. I know part of the reason to send it to ISTC was that ISTC would be sitting on the money and able to distribute more quickly than it was envisioned that the state would be able to do that. That is very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> So, one of the many potential projects that we have that benefit from this is actually a three-party partnership with a large conglomerate and the university. Currently, the conglomerate is fronting the bill and contracting our company and the university is run the university separately. Um, in order to qualify for this, would we restructure it so that our company is contracted with the conglomerate and then subcontracting the university? Would that qualify? I want to be careful there that it doesn't look like I'll make a Caterpillar has hired your company to do work and Caterpillar gets the deliverable of the work, Caterpillar wouldn't have qualified as a large corporation. Okay. And to my understanding, it's up to you what you want to disclose. Again, your source of money coming into the company, just think about it. Are you building, I think that's different if you're a service model company, but if you're a product company and you have a customer, it's going to look a little different at how you describe it. Yeah, the, ultimately, the, the IP is supposed to be open source. You may be able to know that enters into what you're saying at all. Don't know. I wouldn't say it precludes it. No, and I would, I would be curious to see how is the university partner's feelings on it. The only thing on that would be, if I'm reading it as a reviewer, I might think, okay, this was an open source product that you're developing. How do you commercialize that beyond? Does it have upward revenue potential, or is it a fun project to be doing from a research perspective. It's now out, the, out in the public domain. You have no freedom to operate that as a private product or service in the future. University reviewers, from what I understand right now. So it is ISTC staff who are not scientists themselves, any of them. So, and then they are supposed to be able to bring in, they had, I think, 10 different tech or industry organizations that said that they would help. And then in some cases, those of us, so Northwestern, U of C, IIT, SIU, that are on the board that happen to be from higher ed are addressing basic questions, non-technical, of like, a company has proposed to do this with the university, what do you think of that? I'm not an official reviewer, so I'm gonna be careful in that. But for example, we had early in the process a question about you need to pay, a company is engaging with the university over IP. So you have contract with the tech transfer office and you owe royalties or upfront patent costs or something like that, could this program pay for those costs? All of us pretty unanimously said, doesn't seem like that was the intent of the program. You're not getting any new invention or new product ingenuity by that. It was already invented before, and that's an administrative burden that was part of your contract as a small business. So those are the kind of like philosophical things we're chatting about in the ether, more so than does this kind of optical imaging a good thing or a bad thing, and it's the credibility of your business there or not. I think you. If you say things like, I was already peer reviewed and I have SBIR funding, or I'm affiliated with the University of Illinois in this prestigious lab, I think that they're going to assume the science works. 
It's always helpful too. I think as long as you're not doing academic research anymore, kind of thinking about um, the commercialization and the commercial value of what you're developing. I always think it's good to have like an investor in mind as the audience for a lot of these kinds of proposals. So that's, that's the level of technical language you should be pitching in. FAQ, it says that we can only receive one voucher as an award, but can multiple applications be submitted? I think so, but you're only going to get max right. of one award. Right. It may look odd if you have a bunch flooding them, so okay. be a little cautious there. And it, it might be good to, like, I would talk be happy about to also, like, review. We, can, we also have a DCEO, Regional Economic Development um, Officer in our office, so Katie Simpson she would also be happy to look over and give you a, an opinion. Okay. So is it best to contact you like after we have something together for opinions or I don't know? I was going to say, if, if using somebody like Madeline to review is great. Third party, yeah, that, that's for me and I feel like for us in the university we can give some ideas and our EIRs might be able to look at it, but have somebody maybe before you send it to ISTC say what, say what they think of it. This is not a bad idea and just are we framing this in a way that sounds like it's for commercialization, but it's product improvement and not just science for science sake. That's yeah. what I think you're trying to say. I would be utilizing SPDC. I would also reach out to Gerald yeah. and yeah. even other resources at Research Park. Okay. That's cool. what I would do. Trifecta. Nice. Okay. And we can submit I'm trying to be careful not to have direct advocacy on any single application with ISTC, but we have given them, hey, we have these applicants from Enterprise Works, look out for them. That kind of thing's okay. Of us saying, not from Enterprise yeah. Works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we worked with these three clients in the last quarter. We'd love for you to give them a review. Something that's a little less, I'm specifically endorsing one application over another. Because I, yeah, just trying to be. Just trying to be a good citizen here, but also um, make sure that our applicants are known to have some affiliation or a little bit of endorsement from us that they didn't come from completely out of nowhere. I think is nice also for our partners that are doing the reviewing that they understand there's lineage and affiliation with the place that they work with. Cool. Not necessary, but I think it can help. And if you worked with SBDC, I mean, say that, because they care yeah. about that too. So yeah, and I think saying, you know, like we came out of it, we used the resources of our community and we have friends that we worked with in the state already. Yeah, the DCO already invests money in. That's what also helps me. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you. Sorry we kept you a while.